People's lives can be changed, even dramatically, but not by the ways most expect it to happen. Well, some try to turn their lives around by getting more money so they can live in great luxury. Uh, others try to become very famous and powerful so they can control things around them and be envied. Uh, some uh, become obsessed with health. Uh, they think that if they're stronger and free from sickness, that's all they really need to be happy in life. There's a lot of unhappy, healthy people. Some try to drown their troubles in a constant barrage of music, movies, TV, video games. Sadly, some turn to drugs. It helps them escape the way things really are, hide from the problems that depress or upset them. And there's those who become so zealous about political and social causes that they actually imagine that by promoting certain laws or by showing some kind of compassion, uh, they're going to feel more successful and maybe even earn God's favor by impressing Him a whole lot. But none of these things really change the person on the inside. Uh, they often find some unsatisfied soul still living deep within when we live this way, thinking that somehow what we do can make the change. But when God changes people, it's a dramatic transformation on the inside first. He changes what we are, not just what we feel, think, or do. Uh, these are the results of the inner change that God brings about. But there was change sweeping through the lives and, of people around the Mediterranean during that first century of the Christian era. Christianity was advancing, and it was transforming both individuals and entire communities. But it wasn't the first time God that moved that way, and it wasn't the last. Uh, but the fulfillment of God's promises by the work of Jesus Christ uh, back in that first century was a radical advancement in our understanding of what it really means to be transformed by God. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, it, it had to do with the resistance to that Christian message. Uh, the churches there were facing problems being stirred by opponents of the gospel. Uh, from outside the church, there were political and pagan leaders who didn't like the message of Christianity at all. It was having an influence on the, the weak people that they were able to control, and they were losing control of those who came to Christ. Uh, some Jews didn't like to see Christian Jews accepting Gentiles as God's people without requiring circumcision first. And the historian Josephus confirms that uh, these groups became fierce persecutors of the early Christians. Well, at first, uh, the man we know as the Apostle Paul was among the Jewish attackers. Uh, his becoming a Christian presented a serious problem to them. Uh, his careful reasoning from Scripture just pointed out that they had misunderstood the Bible. They didn't want to admit that. Uh, but his obviously transformed life was evidence that was very hard to discredit. So they focused their attack on the Apostle Paul in particular. But they didn't understand what Christianity was really all about. They didn't have redeemed eyes to see the power of God at work, and they saw the struggles believers were going through then from the persecutions uh, as uh, evidence that God was not with them. They didn't see their growth as strength, but as weakness. But there were problems from within the churches, too. Uh, as the truth of God spread, ideas in the church had to mature. Uh, and some came to believe that when Paul was coming correcting errors that he saw, he was changing the Christian message from what Christ had given. And so they attacked the apostleship by denying his special authority from God. They tried to discredit him by implying that he got his authority from hanging out with the Jerusalem apostles. Uh, then uh, he turned against them, they envisioned. And he got into arguments with Peter and James, which is true, but not in the same way that they were implying. Uh, some were confused by false rumors and by Paul's teachings about God's law, which they totally misunderstood. And these distortions were confusing the members of the early church. And so in this next part of the letter to the Galatians, Paul was answering back. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, he begins to explain and to warn. Uh, here he said, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to men. For I neither received it from men, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So God was the source of Paul's message, not the apostles. Uh, actually, the apostles received their message directly from God, too. But Paul wasn't uh, instructed by human teachers, and he didn't uh, get his authority from Jerusalem. It came by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. The story of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus was well known, but it wasn't well understood then. 
uh, the great persecutor of the church had now become its primary promoter. And it was the top news story of the day among the, the Jews and among the early Christians. Paul evidently told about it often when he was visiting different local congregations. But Paul clearly evidenced a dramatic change in his life caused by God's work of grace. He goes on to continue here in verse 13. He said, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So Paul was reminding them about his former life as a persecutor of the church. Some were well aware that he was a persecutor. In the early days of the church, a Christian named Stephen was put to death for his faith. And Acts chapter 6 tells us how his message about Christ was misunderstood. Uh, the Jewish leaders just qu didn't quite catch on. And so they accused Stephen of being against the temple and against the teachings of Moses. They said in Acts chapter 6 verse 14, For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Well, the same false accusations were now being made against the Apostle Paul, which is why he wrote to the Galatians. Back then, in the time of Stephen, uh, when Paul was still known as Saul of Tarsus, Paul was a supporter of the attacks on the first Christian uh, martyr. Uh, and Stephen's defense to those who wrongly accused him is recorded for us in Acts chapter 7. And there he traced the long history of God's covenant and showed that Moses and the ceremonies of the temple predicted the coming of Jesus Christ. And he pointed out how many Jews and their ancestors had repeatedly defied God's actual teachings and they had to be judged by God over and over again. But he clarified his support for Moses in the temple. Uh, Jesus didn't come to eliminate what God said was true, right, and good. He brought the promises of the law to their fullness, to their completion. He brought about what they were foreshadowing and what they were saying would happen. And he told them that the temple worship had been com corrupted at their time, uh, different from what God had originally said it should be. Uh, it was the Jewish abuses that brought about God's judgments uh, in the past, and it was going to again real soon, and it will again many times bring God's judgment upon those who rebel against him. But they still don't understand what Stephen was telling them, and so they stoned him to death. They stoned him for what they understood as attacking their historic beliefs, when in fact they were the ones who had departed from their historic beliefs. Then Acts chapter 8 tells us about this man named Saul of Tarsus. Uh, he supported the attacks against uh, the Christians and the killing of Stephen. And he persecuted the church relentlessly, and he tried to silence the message of Christ. And though he was trained by the great rabbi Gamaliel, he really misunderstood God's law what it actually represented and its teachings about the Messiah. But then in Acts chapter 9, we hear about the conversion of Saul, whom we now know as the Apostle Paul. Before that, his zeal was for the traditions and customs of that distorted form of God's law. But in Christ, he came to defend God's teachings as they were originally intended. And when he wrote this letter, the same distortions that had confused him before his conversion were troubling the Galatians. God preserved it for us in his word because some of these basic ideas are still troubling the church today. But the change in Paul was caused by God's work of grace in the heart. He wanted to make this very, very clear. Let me continue here with verse 15. Here Paul said, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me through grace to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remind him, uh, or remained with him fifty days, fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. So it wasn't the influence of the apostles that transformed Paul. He didn't first go to consult with the church leaders in Jerusalem and become indoctrinated by them. His transformation was by God's grace alone, and he went to Arabia and then returned to Damascus. 
and it was three years later that he went to Jerusalem to see Peter for 15 days. But it wasn't men, it was the same God who gave him physical life originally, separating him from his mother's womb, that now gave him spiritual life through Christ. God's call of grace brought him to know Christ and called him to deliver Christ to the Gentiles. And since he was directly called by the Savior, this made him the last of the true apostles. But it wasn't a, a cultish conversion where the apostles brainwashed him. Uh, the only other Christian leader he saw, he tells us, was James, the Lord's brother. And so the churches were amazed when Paul finally came preaching the faith that he once attacked. Let's continue with verse 21. Paul says, Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they were hearing only. He who formed, formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. Well, you can imagine the uncertainty of the persecuted believers at first. The one who had legal orders to arrest them and abuse them came to church on Sunday. Well, they had only heard reports, but they hadn't actually seen these things for themselves. But when Paul came and he showed them the change that few thought was possible, that former persecutor had without question really changed. Now he promoted what he once tried to destroy. It was like that change in the old sea captain, the slave trader John Newton. Uh, he not only became an opponent of slavery and an Anglican minister, but he fully credited that entire change to God's amazing grace, which became the title of the famous hymn that he wrote. And when the people met and got to know the converted Saul of Tarsus, they glorified God for what they saw in Paul's life. Well, it's a fact. God does change people. And Paul wrote about this often in his letters, which, of course, became books of the New Testament scriptures. Let me put up another section here to show you some of these verses that Paul wrote. <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians 5.17, he said, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Here in Galatians, a little later in chapter 6, verse 15, he writes, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Ephesians 4.24, when he's writing to the churches in Ephesus, he said, And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. And when he wrote to the churches in Colossae, in Colossians 3.10, Paul said, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, according to the image of him who created him. <clears throat> well, these are just some of the passages where Paul tells us about the change that Christ brings about. What was old, our old relationship with, with God and with his word and his law, has all been transformed by Christ. Now we have a new relationship. We're a new person in the sense, not that now you like different things, you're you know, whereas you didn't like Brussels sprouts before, now you would. You're still the same person in that sense. But your entire relationship with God, with Christ, your relationship with sin, has all been transformed into something new. And so uh, this uh, is all explained there in the Bible by the power of the Holy Spirit when he opens our eyes to behold it. And we have compelling evidence in changed lives as well as in the very words of God of the power of God. But the gospel of Christ isn't just theory or a cultish fad. It's a fact that fits with what God had promised and said all through human history. Uh, real change doesn't come by deciding to be different. It's not our determination and intelligence or upbringing or kindness that transforms us. It's the supernatural work of God that does what we just can't do. We're different when we're regenerated by the grace of God our lives then should clearly show that change, the work of the gospel. Others uh, should be able to see that at work in us. Now, it's not going to be perfect, but there should be a fundamental change in attitude and values in our lives. People should see that evidence of change in us. It doesn't mean we won't sin, but when we do, we won't be defending it, trying to blame other people. We'll humbly confess it and then openly declare how thankful we are for the grace of Christ who took that burden upon himself and paid it in our place. 
people need to see that evidence of change in us. Now, they might not understand the change right away. They might attribute it to other causes. Uh, so it's important that we obediently also explain what God has done. Give him the credit for it so people know we're not changed because of something that we did. Uh, the change is a work of God's grace, and it implants an inner confidence in us of the promises of the gospel. And so we come to trust God that he's reliable, uh, that he's done and always will do what he says. And we accept that his ways are always the best ways even when human wisdom might prefer something else or think that another way would be better. Uh, our deliverance from guilt and the, the promise of eternal rest and glory was secured for us over 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. And before that, it was determined eternally by the love of God to take place, uh, not by the things that we do or that anyone ever did, but by that work, that turning point in history of the death of Christ. And our failures to be conforming to Christ-like behavior take place because we're trusting in the wrong things. Redeemed Christians might think they can reform themselves by determination, but that can't work. They imagine they can uh, better use what God entrusts them uh, if they put their own needs and interests first. And they take care of what I need, then I can work for Christ better. But that never works. They think they can squeeze in a little time for God uh, in their lives, and that'll be enough. But the fallacy is, it's not your life. You were bought with a price, the price of the life of Christ. And now you belong to him. And that's a very good possession to be. We can confidently rest in our Savior and, and let go of all those deceptive delusions. God calls us to put off the old ways, the old man, and stir up uh, all those good things, suit up in the new man. Uh, you know, we can live joyfully in Christ and be a shining light to those around us, regardless of our past or even our present. We can be a blessing to others and a servant of God by simply living with full confidence in the Savior, humbly, obediently trusting in his teachings. See, there's no secret or special work we have to do to be growing in Christ. It's all been done by him and is applied by the living Holy Spirit that he grants to us. By trusting in his promises, we can discover a change that transforms us into joyful children of God. Our whole outlook is different on life. We don't have to bring about joy because of what we do or what we attain. It's all been secured for us. We obtain it by laying hold upon the promise of our living Savior and all that he's done. And uh, when we discover this wonderful change that he has promised and produced, it makes us hungry to know more about it. So we study his word. It compels us to be in prayer with him all the time, to let him know what's going on and to be sharing our inner needs with him. And it transforms us. It makes us want to live for his glory. Not because we feel that if we don't, we're going to be punished, but because we want to show him how thankful we are. And that's a far better motive for obedience and joyful living. And it assures us of our eternal place in the family of God.